Mark chapter 12, I'm going to share something that's been on my heart this week. Uh, I actually put a lot of this together on an airplane yesterday. And, um, but I want, you, I want you to hear me out on this. I've been teaching the two commandments that Jesus gave us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and then love thy neighbor. And here's the phrase, as thyself. And, you know, I mocked Joyce Myers because a few years ago, and I, I know this woman, I know, you know, we've had, I've had people who had personally met her, worked for her. She's an evil witch, among other things. And she is not who she portrays herself to be in front of a camera. But anyway, she did a deal here a while back. You know, this teaching about her being rich and her never having any health problems, it stems from this idea that it's you first. That in order to be a Christian, it's you first and everything is focused on you how rich you can be and how healthy you can be and how you can never have problems. It's about you. So she does this teaching where she tells everybody, you know, the Bible says that you're to love your neighbor as yourself. You can't really love your neighbor until you learn to love yourself. Well, let me tell you the problem with America. So I've been on board a ship with 5,000 other people who are the dumbest, stupidest, most inconsiderate idiots I've ever met in my life. Especially at the buffet. <laughs> but I was on a ship full of people who don't have a problem loving their self. Their problem is they love their self too much. And they care nothing about anybody else or anything, especially God. They care nothing about it. <clears throat> so, when I heard, heard, I mean, I watched part of what she was teaching. I got where she was going. I understood it. And it was all about you, 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 you. Well, I want to help you understand what Jesus meant by this statement. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. One of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like. So this one's going to be equal to the first one. You, if you say you love God, but you don't love somebody else, you don't love God. You're a liar. James said you're a liar. John said you're a liar. So this is the first commandment. The second is like, namely this. Thou shalt, say this with me out loud. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, there is none other commandment greater than these. So let's understand then, because in the book of Revelation, when all of these people are being slain by the beast and they're getting their heads cut off, the Bible says they love not their lives even unto the death. So what's up with that? Do they, is the Bible telling you to love yourself and then later on it's telling you that to honor God you have to not love yourself? Well, we're going to understand the difference of what lost people do and what we are called to do as God's people. Okay? Heavenly Father, help me preach this message. Father, preach it to these people better than you taught it me. And I pray, dear God, that my words and my will would not be displayed today, but your will would be done. And what you once said would be accomplished. Father, help us to love one another. Help us to forgive one another. Help us, dear God, to consider our enemies. And consider the people that have done us wrong. Not the people that are easy to love. Help us, Father, with the people that are hard.
for us to love. That's where we need help. We want to go to heaven when we die. And we know that we cannot have our sins forgiven if we will not forgive others. And we don't know how to do it, Father. We're incapable of doing it. But we are your workmanship, and we ask you, Heavenly Father, to work that in us. It'll be a miracle. But that's the kind of God that you are. You're a miracle, God. Father, I'm asking you to bless your word today to all of those who will listen. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Now, understand how God made you. Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Notice there's a number there. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. He said it three times. Because we know that God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So that number and how God made us matches Him. In that, the Bible teaches us that when you are referring to me, there may be a difference in what you're talking about when you're talking about me. Are you talking about my spirit, my soul, or my body, my flesh. Because I'm telling you, when you, if you're going to pick me apart and say all manner of things against me, I want you to know that that's my flesh. And I agree with probably everything you said. My heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. This flesh body is not going to heaven. It is going to rot into the ground and be burned up when God destroys the first heaven and the first earth. This flesh has accomplished nothing that I even want to talk about in this life. But I assure you, my soul is altogether different. If you hate my flesh, you don't hate it near as bad as I do. I hate it. I hate it even as I get older. And my body is incapable of maintaining the strength of its youth. And isn't that true that through life we gain this amazing wisdom to be able to know what to do, but by the time we get that wisdom, our bodies are... <laughs> and we can't do it. That's the vanity of this world. So, when Joyce Myers talks about loving yourself, she's talking about loving the pleasures of yourself. What your flesh can acquire and accrue in this life, she can have it. I want, nothing, I want nothing to do with it. But what God is talking about, what Jesus is talking about here, is that you love your soul. Now let me tell you about my love for my soul. I have a vested interest in this soul not going to hell. I know my flesh is going to the grave. Let it. It's like peeling the peel of a banana. The peel has no use whatsoever. Take it off. Discard it. What's inside is the real thing. We don't, we don't say, oh, I love banana peels. Or orange peels. I love oranges and I love bananas. I love what's on the inside. Are you getting what I'm saying? So as far as hating myself, I despise my flesh. What I love is my own soul, and I don't want my soul to go to hell. You understand now what I'm saying? That's Because that's what I wrote. Love thyself, your soul. So let me show you what I mean. Turn to Genesis. 
Chapter 1 and 2, very quickly. Uh, I don't know what Jason preached last week, but I see that my, my troll, anti-troll away spray is up here. I don't know, did he use that? Or maybe one of you did to get him out of here. Get out of here, Jason Cooley. I appreciate him, appreciate him. He just happened to be here the week I was gone, so I said, you're preaching. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and God said, let us, let us make man in our image after a likeness. That's, he said it three times. Us, our, our. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth. Environmentalists hate that, but man has dominion. And over the, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now look in Genesis 2, verse 7. Here's the, as Paul Harvey would say, here's the rest of the story. Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's your flesh. That's all you are. Is dirt. And there's white dirt. Black dirt. Red dirt. Yellow dirt. All the colors of dirt are all the colors of people. So we're all made of the same dirt and to the dirt we return. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became, look at what it says, and man became a living soul. So... Who you really are on the inside is your soul. And your spirit is connected to that. My belief is the spirit, if you want to know where your spirit is located in you, I think it's in your DNA. Because your DNA is a book that God wrote and God's word is his spirit. Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit. I think your spirit is in your DNA. But anyway, beside that. God took Adam, breathed his breath. I want you to think about this. God imparted something of himself in us. And he did it to every human being. Every human has a soul. I preached a series of messages on this maybe a couple years ago. You have a soul. So I taught about the soul. So what I love is my soul. What I care about, about me, is where my soul spends eternity. And when it comes to loving your neighbor or others as yourself, what he means by that is, if you love your soul enough to not want it to go to hell, that's how much you're supposed to love other people's souls. Now I want you to think for a minute about how bad hell is. Are you thinking about it? I said, I'm going to give you a minute. The heat, the flames, the agony. The gnashing of teeth. Pain so intense. And it never is relieved. It never goes away. I illustrated it at camp this year like this. I was trying to teach these kids about hell. I had one night to do it. And I said, imagine that your whole body caught on fire. Every part of your skin is on fire. Your whole body is on fire for one second. And then somebody puts it out. After one second, even though the fire is out, after a minute, that pain is going to grow in intensity. Every part of your skin is going to turn red. It's going to be inflamed. And all the nerves connected to your skin are going to be shooting pain signals to your brain. You're going to be overwhelmed with pain. Now, you'll live through it. 
That's the bad news. After only one second of being on fire, you have to deal with the, and you'll have pain for about two or three weeks. Eventually that'll subside. Now, imagine being on fire now, your full body on fire for 10 seconds. Let's count that. One, two, three. You're on fire. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then somebody puts it out. Now, the pain is excruciating. You have to go to the hospital. There are what they call third degree burns on most parts of your body. You'll spend months in the hospital with them peeling off dead, charred skin off of you. Probably they will put you into a chemically induced coma because the pain is going to be so bad that it'll put you in shock. Your, your body physically cannot handle that much pain and they'll, prob they'll probably put you in a coma just out of mercy. But that was only 10 seconds. If you live through it because of the infection, because you've lost skin, if you live through that, you'll have pain the rest of your life. That skin never gr grows back right, does it? Never does. And you'll be in pain the rest of your life. That's 10 seconds. 10 seconds of being on fire. Now imagine you got caught in your house and you're on fire for 30 seconds. I'm not even going to count that out. Just 30 seconds and you're probably not going to live. You'll probably die either at the scene or in the hospital from just 30 seconds. The rich man that Jesus spoke about in Luke 16 has been on fire now for 2,000 years straight with no relief. Now here's what I want, you, I want you to ask the question. Number one, do you want to go there? Here's the next question. Who do you hate so bad that you want them to go there? Who do you hate so bad that you want them to spend 2,000 years plus screaming on fire. If you do, I'm not going to say you're not saved. I'm going to say if you are, you really need to ask God to help you with that. I'm mad at a few people. Very angry. I don't want any of them to go there. That's what he meant. Let me show you. Turn to Psalm 6. <clears throat> now, let me... Let me say what, let me tell you what the Bible says about these people that right now you don't love them and you don't want to because of something they did to you. Let me tell you how the Bible tells us as Christians to deal with that. There are some people in this life that you are never going to get along with, ever. Some of those people might be just as saved as you are. Forgiveness does not have to mean fellowship. 
Just because you forgive somebody, that does not mean that you have to move in with each other and then like everything they say and do from here on out. That is, that's not in the Bible. Abraham and Lot got into it. God saved them both. Paul and Mark, who wrote the book of Mark, got into it. And God saved them both. But they had to get away from each other. They forgave each other, loved one another. Jacob and Esau, Jacob and Esau met together. Genesis 32, 33, in those chapters, Esau forgave. Jacob said, come live with me. We'll, we'll be brothers again. Esau said, I don't belong where you are. And they separated. Loving somebody and not wanting them to die and go to hell does not mean that we all have to go to the same church together. Okay? God, God understands that we live in a vain world and we have problems with people and we all don't get along. God's the one separated us to begin with. He separated us by race, by family, by language, and then location. God divided the world in half. Okay? God's the one who, who allows that. He understands it. But here's what I'm talking about. Psalm 6, verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. Look at here, my soul, my soul is sore vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my what? Deliver my soul, not my flesh. I say to God, God, crucify my flesh. Don't deliver my flesh. I don't, listen, if they came up with a cure for death tomorrow, genetically, I don't want it. I do not want it. I want this body gone. Because I know the one I'm going to get afterward is going to be a lot better. So I'm not asking God, deliver my sorry flesh. Deliver my soul. Oh, save me for thy mercy's sake. That's you loving your soul. That's you loving, you are pleading with God. God, save, have mercy on my soul, God. God, forgive me. God, pull me out. That's you loving yourself. That's how you're supposed to love the person that you don't want to see them ever again. Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting what? The law, the, the Bible is given to us to convert our soul, not our flesh. Now, I will say to you, there are people in this world who are not just wicked in their flesh. They are wicked down to their soul. They're, they deserve hell and they're going to get it. Okay, There is no conversion for them. Now... Follow me on this one. Psalm 22, Psalm 35, Psalm 34. Look at what your Bible says. He, hear, the, hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 22, verse 20. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. The Bible's telling, he's putting these two words together. Your soul is your darling. You didn't know that word's in the Bible, did you? Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, oh, my darling, oh, my soul. That's, it's in there. Do you know what it means? Darling means my dear one. And isn't that true? When you say to your wife, you're my darling. I say it to my granddaughters. Don't I, Michaela? Come here, darling. Give, come here, give, dar give Bob Paul a darling hug. Come on, darling. I say it to my girls. You're my darling. You know why? Because they're dear to me. That's my soul. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. He's put those, and he did it again. Um, 
Psalm 35, verse 17, Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. That's twice now he said it. He called his soul his dear one. And I don't know about you, my soul is dear to me. I do not want to lose my soul. I do not want my soul to spend eternity in the lake of fire. I do not want that for my darling. I've got a love for my soul that calls me to beg God to help me forsake my sin in my flesh and crucify my desires and my wickedness so that I could be with God in heaven forever. And then, check out Psalm 34. This is going to grab you. Psalm 34, verse 1 and 2. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul, look at here. My soul shall make her boast. Here's the Bible telling you twice now that your soul is your darling. And the third time it's telling you it's a her. And see, that makes sense now. Because Christ is the bridegroom, the male. And the church is always characterized as the female, his bride. But it's not our flesh. Because then Christ marries another man. And that's wrong. He's not marrying a man. He's marrying her. Our soul. And I've got teachings on this. Man, I can take you all through scripture and show you that. I can show it to you in doctrine. I can show it to you in typology. I, I love this teaching. Of how it's our soul that Christ. Christ loves. Listen to this now. Christ loves your soul enough that he went and died on the cross for it. Not your flesh. Not your flesh. Your soul. Your darling. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. So here's what I'm, here's what I'm getting at. Psalm 74, O deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove unto the multitude of the wicked. Forget not the congregation of thy poor forever. Do you know we're the turtle dove of God? Of Jesus? The Spirit of God is like a what? A dove. Now it's not a dove that looks like a turtle. I don't know why they call it a turtle dove, it's a turtle, but it's a dove. And he's calling our soul that. Deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove unto the multitude of the wicked. The multitude of the wicked is in hell. And they're going to hell. Every one of them. Psalm 86, 13. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from where? Lowest hell. Now here's what I want to tell you. Everybody look up. When you love your neighbor as you love yourself, maybe, just maybe, somebody that you're at odds with, maybe you two can work it out. And then you have a wonderful relationship after that. That's happened. I had a guy come to me. He was in one of the singing groups that the Bible college I went to, they send the singing groups out to the churches to bless the churches, promote the school, so on. I wasn't in any of those groups. He was. And they asked me to fill in one weekend because their lead singer was going somewhere and they knew I could fill in. And they asked me to fill in and travel with the group that weekend to go to these churches. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. So the tenor singer comes to me in my dorm room. He says, Mike, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah, come on in. And he said, I heard that you're going to be filling in for us this weekend. I said, yeah. I thought he would say, man, I'm, I'm glad you're coming. Man, I like your singing. And he said, when I found out about it, I was ticked off. I threw a chair in my dorm room. I went, why? He said, because I hated you. <gasps> me? You hated me? And here's what he said. 
And he was right. He said, I had you pegged as one of the most arrogant, cocky guys I've ever met in my life. And you know what? At that time in my life, he was dead right. And we talked. And we prayed. And from that day until the day we both left, the last day we were together at Bible college, we were the best friends. And I mean, we did everything together. Maybe. But see, it took him coming to me to bring me down off my high horse. I had offended him deeply and didn't even know it. And he came to me and we worked it out. And God blessed that. Now, I'm not saying God will do that in every situation. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this. I know what it's like to hate somebody and you never want to see them ever again. I know that. I don't like it. But it's been there. But I want you to stop and think about hell. And, and them, not their flesh, their soul. In hell forever. And what I'm saying is, if you loved your own soul enough that you intervened in, what, in the way your flesh was going and said, God, stop me in my life of sin and bring me to salvation and then kill this body off because I don't want it. I don't want what it does. I don't, want, I don't want what it wants. I want it gone. If you can say that about yourself, surely you can at least ask God to save the person you hate. Am I right? Because what, and, and I'm talking about real salvation. I'm not talking about fake church stuff. Because if God really saves that person, what did he do to you when he saved you? Changed you. He made you a different person than the idiot jerk that was on the cruise ship with me all last week. All 5,000 of them. Lisa and I were the only two people that were right on that whole ship. Can you imagine that? I couldn't believe it. If God truly saves them, He'll change them. He'll turn them into something better than they ever was. Something that will never hurt you again. Ever. Now again, I'm not saying, because you may look at them and say, I know they're saved, but I just can't, I can't do it. Fine. But don't hate them so bad that you want them to spend eternity in hell fire. And I've done this before, hardest thing I've ever done. God, I am so angry. I'm so hurt and I'm so full of hate in my flesh for somebody that God, your word commands me to pray for my enemies. And God, against my own will, I'm asking you to save my enemies. Hardest thing I've ever done. But that's obedience. It's not flesh obedience, soul obedience. It can be done. Bow our heads. So I'm going to go around the room. You're going to stand up and tell about everybody you hate, all right? No. But I'm going to ask you to... I'm not even going to ask you to pray for your enemies to be saved. I'm going to ask you to ask God to help you do that. 
And that way, you'll know that it was God. Now, will God save them? We're going to leave that up to God. But I'm going to ask you to ask God to help you do this one right thing. Just one. Remember, we only have two commandments. Love the Lord your God. That's the easy one. Love the people you hate and pray for the salvation. That's the hard one. But it's only one thing. Just one. Father, thank you Thank you for that man coming to my room and making a friend out of an enemy. And God, I have a lot of enemies. There are those out there that really hate me. And I don't want them to. That bothers me. I want to know what I did. I want to know where I was wrong. How I offended them. I want to know that. Because I don't want to do that to people. So Father, I know there's people out there that hate me. And I pray, Father, that you... For your glory's sake and your name's sake and for their sake and my sake. God, that you would help them to not hate me anymore. Now, Father, there are people out there that I hate. And I don't like it. I don't like it when I'm constantly afraid that I'm going to see them. Afraid of what I might say or do. I just don't like hating people. But my emotions, I am not capable of controlling my emotions. Father, I ask you to help me in my soul to love them enough to pray that you would save them. And all the time, Father, my flesh is saying, don't do that, don't do that, That's, that don't do it. We want them dead. But Father, I hate my flesh anyway, so... I'm not going to listen to my emotions. I'm going to listen to your word. And I'm going to pray what you have commanded me to pray with your help and your grace. Father, like Jesus did when he's hanging from a cross and he prayed for the people who drove the nails. Father, forgive them. So Father, I'm asking you to help me pray that my worst enemies and the people that I am so angry at I pray, dear God, that you would help me to love them enough to pray that they would not go to hell. Because what they did, they deserve hell. 
for what they did, they deserve hell. But so do I. So Father, help these people to help them to pray for their enemies to not go to hell. We're asking one thing, Father. We're asking for your help and your grace to love them in this way only, to love them enough to not want them to spend eternity in hell. Help Help us, Father, do that. And Father, when we close this prayer, we're going to wait for you to move our hearts. And they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. So Father, bless your people today and help us all. I love you and thank you, God, for giving me this word. I needed it. My family needs it. My church needs it. The world needs it. Help us to forgive. We pray this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet?